Okay, well, good morning. My name is Didi Long, and I am pleased to welcome all of you to the second day of our virtual conference, which has been organized around the theme of where do we go from here? Our first session today is devoted to the arts as a way forward. It is my honor to serve as the chair of the board of directors for the Fulbright Association this year. I am the Emeritus Director of Study Abroad and International Exchange and past Fulbright Program Advisor at the University of Arkansas. In 2006, my Fulbright was in Germany where I participated in a three week seminar for international education administrators. So as you can see, my background is not in the arts, but I can say that I'm closely associated with the arts having a brother who is a sculptor a husband who is a craftsman, and a long line of both collectors and dealers of fine art in our family. Truly, we can always look to the arts to provide insight, to elicit emotion, to find joy, and to bring inspiration. Art is a universal language and a common thread between our cultures. Today, we bring you four accomplished artist educators to share their work in theater, public art, dance, and music. I will begin by introducing all four of them to you. Each presenter will then have about 10 minutes to speak and or perform. We will save questions and answers for the end of all the presentations, but please feel free to submit your questions as they come to you by using the Q&A box below and making sure to indicate which presenter you are addressing your question to. I will do my best to direct these questions as appropriate following the last presentation. We will first hear from Heather Barfield. Her presentation is entitled, Devising Theater Together and Apart, Innovating Multivocality in Performing Migrant Stories. Heather is a professor of drama at Austin Community College. She has worked as performer, scholar, director, producer, writer, archivist, and arts administrator within the Austin, Texas theater and cultural communities. She has a PhD in performance as of public practice from the University of Arkansas, uh, sorry, from the University of Texas at Austin, and has served as Associate Artistic and Development Director at Vortex Repertory Theater. In fall 2019, Heather traveled to France as a U.S. Fulbright Scholar, where she conducted theater research and curated community-devised performances with migrant communities in Aix-de-Provence and Marseille. Our second presenter will be Jacob Carter speaking to us on the topic of building bridges, creative expression as a vehicle for dialogue across difference. Jacob is a PhD candidate in international education at UMass Amherst with more than 14 years of experience working with four impact organizations in the USA and in Central America. He's a teacher, a national policy researcher and a change maker, spearheading all kinds of initiatives for nonprofits and public schools. In 2015, he was awarded a Fulbright Clinton Scholarship to Guatemala. Jacob is a co-founder and the current project director for Building Bridges, a public art and engagement initiative at UMass Amherst that draws on the power of solidarity and creative expression to bring people together and to build bridges. Following Jacob, we will hear from Laurel Victoria Gray, who has titled her presentation as a good dancer can perform in a single space. How Zoom brought Uzbek dance traditions to global homes. Dance scholar, choreographer, performer, and costume designer, Laurel specializes in women's dances from Silk Road cultures in the Islamic world. Laurel has been called the pioneer of Uzbek dance in America. She has studied dance in Central Asia and the Caucasus including two years at the invitation of Uzbekistan's state academic Bolshoi Theater. In 1995, she founded the award-winning Silk Road Dance Company. In 2015, 2015, they performed at the very first White House Nara's celebration. In 2009, Gray um, Laurel was, was selected to present the Fulbright Association Selma Jean Cohen International Dance Scholar Lecture. She currently teaches global dance history at George Washington University. Our final presenter will be Pamela Haldand. Her presentation is titled, Music Unites Us. Pamela is an arranger, composer, and educator based in North Carolina. A gifted American pianist, 
She holds the title of Steinway Artist. In 2017-18, she was a U.S. Fulbright Scholar to Poland, where she taught um, about American music, continued her research on Chopin, and gave more than 35 performances throughout Poland and Denmark. Pamela trained at the Wisconsin Conservatory of Music and holds a Doctorate of Musical Arts from the Eastman School of Arts of Music. She has appeared from coast to coast, recorded 18 CDs, and has over 11 million listeners of her version of Chopin's Farewell Waltz on Spotify. So without further ado, um, it is my pleasure to turn this over to our fantastic panel. So I'm gonna ask Heather to begin. Unmute and I will share my screen. So good morning. I am very excited to um, be here with you all. I hope that my screen is being shared and that you can all hear me okay. Um, so here we are. Um, devising theater together and apart, innovating multivocality and performing migrant stories. So this was my um, my Fulbright, I just returned in um, January of 2020, so I'm still processing a lot of stuff, and I'm really, really honored to be able to present all of this to you. Um, just to give you a sense of location of where I was, I was in Aix-en-Provence and in Marseille, and I was there as a single parent, actually, and I had brought my son with me. The mountain that you saw behind me is Cezanne's mountain in Aix-en-Provence, which he would paint regularly and um, in which I would go to visit. So I feel like I was really walking at, literally in the foothills of some great artists in Aix. Um, this research project um, is a collaborative or was, um, still is in a way, because I'm still working with this group, um, collaborative, creative, theatrical and arts-based uh, project that focuses on migrants in and around Aix-en-Provence um, and in partnership with Aix-Marseille Université and a couple of local NGOs, as well as a theater organization, La Seine Manessa. <clears throat> um, I was working with these to refugee services organizations, both of whom um, I uh, discovered or kind of came in contact with while I was there. So it was a lot of figuring out um, the community that I was going to work with um, that that were not the actor that was not the actor community, but rather the non-actor community. Um, one of these organizations is called Collectif Agir, and Collectif Agir um, is in X, and they help refugees with things like housing, paperwork, um, immigration status, interviews, um, things like that. OCM is an organization that um, uh, is, it helps uh, victims of um, human trafficking, and um, the Organisation Internationale contre l'esclave moderne, so against uh, modern slavery, um, if that isn't clear to everyone. So both of these organizations have very similar, um, uh, I guess, uh, clientele that they're working with, um, one of which has a bit more um, women involved, OCM has more women with that organization, and, and Collectif Agir has a lot more young men. So that was an interesting thing to note. So what were we doing? So um, I had to uh, market myself to the community in a way to get them in a room together and uh, basically do devised performance storytelling and applied theater and um, self-reflexive ethnography, that would be my part in this, um, to evoke alternative modes of transformational healing and identity and to interrogate cultural assimilation with voluntary participants from both migrant and local communities. Well, okay, so what does that really mean? What does that look like? So if you don't know, this is a catch-all phrase that's been used a lot in theater communities, devise theater, devising theater, what is it? Um, I guess a really broad definition could be uh, that devised theater could be considered creating performance in which the playwright is decentralized from the group's process of manifesting their consensual theatrical imaginary. So in other words, I give the participants prompts. I give them um, a, a very set kind of rigid guideline on uh, what we're doing and where we're going. And then we build upon that. It's almost like we're building kind of a house to create these scenes with various, very specific theater techniques. One of which here would be the playback theater technique where there's music involved um, and there's a storytelling element. This is a, a very uh, specific way of 
of doing shared storytelling with a group as well as shared empathy. And I'm not going to go into the how because it's really extensive <laughs> and I don't have time for that, but um, we used all the elements of the stage and what we were doing. Again, these are non-actor participants. So we were using movement, music, or sound, right? Um, our voices, and it doesn't have to necessarily mean that we're speaking a language, but if there is a language spoken, we're speaking all sorts of languages because a lot of these folk come from all over. And um, French was not their first language and neither was it my first language. So, um, so that was fun. Properties, meaning props, things that you can move around the stage we would use. Uh, we would mess around with the lighting, the dimension, gravity, up, down, but, you know, the distancing and the spacing of the, um, uh, you know, where the placement of people on the stage. So it was really teaching them kind of the 101 theater in the process of doing this um, shared storytelling. The emphasis, of course, for me was on the power of play as a pathway for empowerment, healing, awareness, reflection, and joy, etc. Plays are playful for a reason. So they really uh, we're happy being in these spaces. And this is just an example of, of where we're working in X and the small studio space. The, the workshops or the atelier were repetitive. We were doing this about once a week in X and almost twice a week in Marseille. Um, again, these were planned improvised theater um, techniques that we were using, um, inspired by Augusta Bowal, um, improvisation games, um, performance artwork, um, and a lot of this is in my personal background, a lot of whom are, these are these artists that I've worked with, and then I would create my own types of um, performance-based uh, workshops through that, so it was very, very really uh, an amalgamation. There were usually about eight average participants per workshop. Um, again, working in these migrant communities, you could never be sure who was going to show up. <laughs> so doing scene work that we had been trying to build upon, it always have to be adjusted and adapted every single week. So that was really fun. I got to really think on my feet uh, almost every time we did the workshop. So a sampling of the countries of origin for many of these participants include Lebanon, Turkey, Russia, Nigeria, Syria, Madagascar, Cote d'Ivoire, Chad, Italy, etc., Afghanistan. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is just a sampling of all of the games that we were playing and the and the and the kind of the, where we were going with this. Mirroring exercises were a, a favorite, and the machine. This is a, a sense of where we were. Agir is a tiny little NGO, doesn't get a lot of funding from the government. Volunteer-based organization, nobody's paid, and a volunteer here is showing me all of the clients that they have to um, that they're trying to help, and 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 they're really overworked. And having me come in um, gave them kind of a, a breath of fresh air to their clientele. And, it, and then you could really see the difference in how they approach the world. Um, this is an example of some of the exercises, the great game of power. This is a way to warm up the performers by using chairs instead of their bodies to, um, uh, to, to show a, a specific expressive image uh, based on a word. And they would offer these words um, themselves. Moment work, um, again, a very specific tectonic theater-based um, way of sharing stories, mirroring, more playback theater. And as you can see, these are actors, non-actors that are willing to get into positions and willing to kind of go the mile and, um, and, and find their own voice within this diverse group. And um, I love just sharing all of these images because it, it gives you a sense of kind of the, the, the dynamism that we were working with here. In Marseille, um, the, uh, sometimes I was interrupted with children coming into the workshops. We incorporated the children from the women in the workshops. Um, this is, um, I don't know if you'll be able to hear the sound, but one of the things that I was really interested in doing was incorporating the, um, um, hold on, let me, I'm gonna fast forward, was incorporating the, um, the graffiti of Marseille and the way that the city um, influenced kind of how, kind of the grit and the character of these migrants themselves. Um, so this is just a video I put together for one of the performances that we had done. And, um, and let me just miss that 
so anyway, so there's that. And these are some of the participants. So they showed me around the city in Le Panier district in Marseille. And then we use that as kind of some of the inspirational material. This is the image theater that the group was working with, working with the word fear and triumph. Um, very simple kind of gestural work in the beginning, right? And then we would build upon these gestures and stories to eventually create a, um, excuse me, to create um, a, a final performance for a very select public that was chosen because this is a sensitive community. So the, 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 the folks that, were come to, that came to watch it later um, were, were, was a very specific group. This is the Agir group, again, in Aix-en-Provence. So as you can see, I mean, it just built and built and, and they felt um, very safe and very comfortable working with me. And then when I came back, we had the COVID and I didn't get a chance to really share any of this material with anybody. And I miss the group so much because we really did bond. And the theater world, it, it, some of you may know that the bonding and, and creating those long lasting relationships, it's really powerful. And so we, in May, when nobody knew what was going on, <laughs> started to try to make virtual uh, workshops happen. So this is just a sampling. So the picture in the middle is at um, one of the volunteers home in Aix-en-Provence. And they had actually gotten just out of, of quarantine and their lockdown. And in France, it was a lot stricter. And they were really, you know, they couldn't leave their home. There was a curfew. So at this time period, um, in, in most of this early summer, we were able to kind of play with these workshops. And, um, and these are photos that Helen took for me. And if you see on the far right, that's me doing a mirroring exercise in Zoom with one of the participants and just trying to really reconnect with these folk. And then here's another little sampling of like the, 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 comp, the, 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 the ways that we were, we tried something really simple, which was chore doing a choreographic motion and uh, very simple, almost even robotic. Robotic. Um, and we've got three participants in one room. The woman on the bottom um, is in a different region in the south of France, who's a friend of the volunteer. And, and we're all trying to kind of figure this out together and be in sync. So this was just like um, an early exercise as we built upon later. <laughs> So that we can figure out, can we do this? Can we be in sync? Can we hear each other, um, et cetera? So, so that was a really fun kind of moment figuring that out. And then I would always plan ahead for these virtual workshops in a really similar style that I had planned the workshops when I was in Aix-en-Provence, right? Um, in this case, I used a poem, a Jacques Prévert poem, um, <clears throat> and they would take a line from the poem and then they would try to, um, uh, create an image from that poem, a moving image, a slow kind of moving image, right? And, and repeat it over and over again. So they would choose one line and then um, they would start to form duets with that one line. And so here is, again, this is from the perspective of in Ellen's apartment. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure if you can hear that because um, that was my concern, but they're basically repeating the, the, the line, oh, ma jeunesse, and then the two women are saying, um, uh, la force de, uh, de, de te tuer, okay, the strength that kills you. So, oh, my youth, um, the force that which kills you. And, uh, and, and uh, one of these participants is from Turkey and the other one is from Afghanistan. And then um, there's the French teacher there and one of the volunteers from Azure. So we were really getting kind of the the entire community involved because the staff and the participants would also come to um, to be a part of it. So um, I'm, I know I went through this really fast, but I just I, there's so much information. I'm still processing everything, and I'm not even sure on where I'm at in the time. Maybe I even went under the time. <laughs> But just thinking about the potential outcomes of, of using this kind of, um, I even consider it humanitarian work because it builds confidence in these um, non-actors to, to be in a foreign country, to, to be in a space where it's okay to kind of be silly, to not have to, you know, try to, to be um, uh, something that, that feels they can be who they are in, in the space. And not only can they be who they are in the space with me, but they can um, d make discoveries about who they are when they are challenged to think creatively about um, making choices with, with, with words and dialogue and with movement and, 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 and 
trust building exercises with other folks within that particular group. Um, you know, they people who started in the beginning of my five month time in X by January, I believe that I discovered a couple of really, really good actors whom I would even put in the show by the end of it. And, and the smiles on their faces, uh, it just that to me was evidence that what we were doing was having an effect in them that um, built so much uh, confidence as well as language and communication still skills uh, confidence and they were able to uh, express themselves in ways that um, perhaps they were a little bit more timid to express in the past. Um, collaboration is a, such a big deal. Um, the idea that we're building community here, that we that that the folks within this group really do feel as if we're kind of like a, a tiny little family now, um, very much like a a, a, a show would be. Um, and again, because of COVID, and because it just feels like you know, when I left, it was just like, I had to, I had to go. I mean, we had our closing sort of ceremony, but um, so much of this work lingers. And this was a way for us to kind of combat the social isolation and, and also the, um, the need for us to revitalize some of these, uh, some of the play together. Um, so again, so if we want to go to sort of the further questions in this kind of work, you know, I'm always asking in what ways can performance um, and arts based research enhance global humanitarian efforts that are rooted in collaboration and ethical participation. Again, nobody did anything that they um, didn't want to do. Um, it was very much a volunteer um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting texts on my screen, so I'm a little distracted, but it was very much a volunteer driven um, effort. And that did make it a little bit difficult for me to create like a formal scene to show to the public. So the emphasis was very much on the process and, and, and creating within two to three hours in that group together. You come in one way and you leave a little bit transformed. And I think that we succeeded in that every single time. So I don't know what my time is. I think I'm good. <laughs> I think your timing is perfect. I think you need, you know, to wrap it up. Yep. Thank you. So, so I do have further questions down at the bottom. Um, that's just to think about, you know, how can we help these, um, you know, migrant communities um, in our local communities, and um, you know, and also thinking about, well, what are all these? What are different methods? What are more innovative methods on helping migrants to learn how to, um, if you will, uh, in the French actually really do like this term assimilate right I have problems with this term but it's very much a part of French culture to to to, to become French you know and, and to honor the you know the national identity and um, and understand and learn you know the ways to be if you're going to become a French citizen um, okay thank you very much I'm really grateful to be here so thank you my first presentation at Fulbright Association so thank you so much Wonderful. We're so glad that you um, submitted this wonderful proposal. I just feel like this whole year, everybody's reminding me what an experiment everything is right now. So thank you, Heather. Um, we're going to move straight to Jacob. I think all of our artists are going to use a lot of their full time. So we're going to get re started right away. Jacob, go ahead. Great, thanks so much. Um, and Heather, thanks for that great kickoff presentation. It's really exciting to hear about your work. Um, my name is Jacob Carter and uh, I work at the Partnership for Worker Education here at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Of course, I'm beaming in from my home because as many of you, um, I've been working remotely since early March. Uh, I was a 2015 Fulbright Clinton awardee in Guatemala. Uh, and I was doing research there and working with the national reading program based out of the um, Ministry of Education. And today I'm just gonna talk a little bit about, uh, it's not about my Fulbright research, actually it's about a project that I helped co-found and currently direct, it's called Building Bridges. And I wanna talk a little bit about how we're using creative expression as a vehicle for dialogue across difference. here. So as many of you remember, um, and this is still, of course, occurring at the, but particularly at the start of 2017, there were these long standing political and social conflicts that were just really erupting 
uh, in the US. And it created a real rift in our ability to talk and engage with people who are different than ourselves. Um, there was especially a demonization of immigrants and the other. And we started seeing um, the phrase build bridges, not walls popping up. Um, I bet some of you had these in your own town, maybe in your front yard. Um, but it was a real call to action. It was global, you know, act now, build bridges, not walls. And it was out of this moment um, that the Building Bridges Initiative uh, really grew. And what we do is we focus on the very real and positive possibilities when people can come together to build bridges across race, across religion, class, immigration status, gender, sexual orientation, age, ability, nationality, and more. Um, this is a really dynamic partnership effort. It's between our office, our civic engagement and service learning program on campus, and our Office of Equity and Inclusion. And it's deeply collaborative. Uh, we're regularly working also with International Programs Office, International Faculty, uh, Fine Arts Center. And in today's presentation, I just want to tell you a little bit how we launched. Um, talk about the core projects that we have and hopefully share some voices of participants and then just show how in our classes and the exhibitions and events, uh, also through our public art, that we create a context for dialogue and reflection that draws on the power of solidarity and creative expression. And this is a lovely picture here. Um, it's one of our closing lunches in December um, where we had a great group of people that are participating uh, across campus. And of course, um, as many of you are, you know, missing the, those connections. Um, I just love this. And, and it's important to also just think about all the people that, that, are, um, that are involved. So I want to talk a little bit about how we launched. And as a small group of us got together and said, you know, what can we do to be creative with this concept of build bridges, not walls? And so what we decided to do is stick with the uh, affirmative uh, and affirming concept of building bridges. And we launched the project with um, two massive banners that we put on the Fine Arts Center. You can kind of get a scale um, on this picture here. It's about 25 feet tall, 12 feet wide. And the text has multiple aspects. So from very far away, um, you might just see these huge building bridges, right? As you get closer, you start to see that each one in and of itself is building bridges. And then if you get really close, you'll notice that the text of the large letters are actually made up of the phrase building bridges in 20 plus languages. And those were contributed by um, several of our international student colleagues here on campus. Um, we put this up at a major transportation hub. It's at the front of the Fine Arts Center. Thousands of people are walking by each day. And we thought that would really serve as a call to action, also as a statement of purpose. And then of course, symbolically, it shows that many voices can come together with one resounding message. So we have four core projects. Um, the Our Immigrant Voices Project, Showcasing Worker Artists at UMass Project, our Building Bridges Cards and Art Installations Project, and then Worker Rights and Human Rights. We have a variety of formats. Uh, we have courses for workers and students. We have exhibitions. We have special events that might just be one-time um, events. We have different installations that go up in non-gallery spaces, so just typical everyday spaces. We have film showings and dialogues. We have trainings. And again, all of these seek to create a context for dialogue and reflection. Um, and we wanna bring people together who typically would not be in the same room. As you can imagine on our campus uh, and in many campuses and communities um, all over, there's sharp divisions along class lines and power dynamics. And so we're really specifically focused on elevating the voice and visibility of underrepresented groups on campus, primarily workers, uh, but also students and faculty. And we have a great um, working group made up of workers and students and faculty that help us to think through a lot of the ideas and the programming that we're going to be hosting. So I'll talk to you about each one of those, but I wanted to start off with this short video um, that's just going to show you a little bit about how the cards and art installation project works along with um, just short 
clips from two of our classes, the Arming of Voices class and the Showcasing Worker Artist class. So I'm going to pull up this video here. Um, make sure. My parents are South Korean. I was born in Saudi Arabia. I moved here when I was two years old. I believe really strongly in showing voices that are not heard more often. I am from Bhutan. I am from Peru. I'm from the Dominican Republic. Um, I grew up here though. I come from a far off land called California. <laughs> I really like to see other people like me that are coming from different countries and working at UMass. So I am not alone, basically. UMass gives us the opportunity to to work together here with the different immigrants. In evolving this project, it really is about how do we build bridges across cultures here on campus, and how do we make visible, uh, sometimes underrepresented immigrant groups that are here. We want the same thing, an easy life in a hard world. And then she wrote it in Spanish and in English. Mm -hmm. and the cards have responses to the question, what would you like to bridge? Compassion, expression. So that's a D. Each of these cards is one quarter of a letter. So once we put them all together, we'll have building bridges spelled out very large on a, on a panel. This is called United We Stand, based on the stress and distress about politics today and building bridges between different groups in this country. It stems from a song by John Denver, The Fire and Wings, The Fly Us Home, Shown Dark to Light, and The Butterflies as the Wings. This is my collage on both sides of sexual assault. For me, this is just a very live issue. And then I did one where I tore out uh, recipes from magazines because food is love for me. We are asking everyone to participate in this, whether you're a worker yeah, or a student yeah. or a faculty member. And then we're going to work on building dialogue around some of these responses, unpacking some of the issues that came up in the campus climate survey. So that video just gives you a little bit of a sense of how um, how the cards and the art installation work, especially, um, but also just takes you inside the classroom. Um, and similar to what Heather was saying about really being focused on process, uh, it's so critical to have folks that are in a classroom feeling uh, that they're in a safe space where they're respected, where they can share and be themselves. Um, so I want to first talk about the Armagram Voices Project. So this particularly seeks to amplify the voices and the visibility of immigrant workers on campus. Um, you can imagine that many of the immigrant workers on our campus are in frontline positions or essential workers working in the dining commons. Um, there are also uh, many that are working in custodial and they're oftentimes invisible, right? You can imagine being um, someone working and having people walk by you all day and not look at you, not acknowledge that you're there, right? So that really wears down on people. Uh, and it's, a, um, it's something that we noticed through the campus climate survey, which is, was mentioned in the video, but also of course, in our own work with immigrant workers. And the classes meet each semester and they work together on a creative output. Uh, and so what we have here is one of the creative outputs. This is a 24 foot long panel. Um, and in the class, we have discussions. It's very dialogic. And we talk about issues that are important to the participants in the classroom. And then from that dialogue, we have um, together, we put together these large panels. You can see here, um, this is on a typical wall. This is in the administration building of the chancellor. We're invited to host there. Uh, and then on each panel, you have these small phrases and different um, themes. Uh, this is a really powerful phrase. Just because I don't speak English doesn't mean that I don't have a lot to say, um, right? It's something that perhaps um, an immigrant worker might not feel saying openly, um, but in this format, uh, it feels safe. And it's an important message to get out to the campus community. And it's important for people who are working in spaces um, to hear that and to have the opportunity to reflect on it. And so the context for dialogue occurs when we take these installations and put them in an office space and then invite people to come together to read these words out loud and to get to know um, the participants as well because they also attend. 
Um, the second project that we've done, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is called Photo Voice. Um, so we've had eight participants create photo voices, which include images and personal narratives. And it's a participatory action research technique. Um, this actually comes out of public health, but created by Carolyn Wang and Marianne Burris. And it invites people who are oftentimes overlooked to identify, to represent, and to really enhance the community through photography and storytelling. Uh, and in doing so, they become catalysts for change. Um, and so this is uh, the more, most recent project that we've undertaken. Uh, the second project is showcasing worker artists, which highlights worker artists in the art they create. Um, there's a special focus here on essential workers, right? Folks that are cleaning the restrooms, serving food in the dining halls, tending grounds, um, engaging in clerical tasks, and to celebrate their artistic talents in a way that enriches the UMass community. And this draws actually out of decades of work in our office um, through a program that was called We Are More Than You See, which is very clear, clearly saying, um, we are more than the jobs that we undertake here at the university. We are whole people um, and we have a lot to share and, and our contributions are more than just the work that we do here at the university. So this is a group that helps organize um, exhibitions and events uh, on campus and meets regularly. There's actually a session uh, today of this group. Um, the third project I want to talk about is the Building Bridges Cards and Art Installations. This is a really neat part of the project. This is designed by co-founder Joseph Kripchinski, who is a faculty in art and architecture, who you saw in the video. And essentially, you have these um, small cards. And the cards ask people to respond to the prompts. What differences do you want to bridge or connect? How can we accomplish the goal? Um, that includes a variety of visual and written responses. And then when you put them all together, they create the mosaic that spells out building bridges. Um, and when you do this in a group, you put together the mosaic after everyone's had the opportunity to fill, complete their cards. And then the group analyzes it collectively and you can see the overlapping interests and themes. And then those themes and the discussion that you have are the basis for future planning and collective work. So you can see some uh, examples of cards here. Part of the idea here was to not was, was to not be exclusive to people who consider themselves artists, but really say this is for anyone. And so we had people giving all, totally text responses. We had responses in different languages. We had incredibly artistic responses. Uh, thousands of people have completed these cards. Um, they have been displayed at the Contemporary Museum of Art. Um, and these are the towers. You can get a sense of how large they are and they really attract people. And so we'd set them up um, and invite people to complete a card in different parts of the campus. This is an ongoing project. We're still gathering cards. Uh, the last project is Worker Rights is Human Rights. And this helps to reveal the interconnectedness of worker rights with all aspects of human rights. And it shows the ways that people can come together to advocate for the dignity and respect of everyone. And this is where we have um, a course that's centered on a public film showing. Uh, this is a partner with our partnership with our labor center. And we started out looking at civil rights and the struggle of sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, 1968, where Dr. Martin Luther King was ultimately murdered um, to look at civil rights and that struggle. We then this next semester looked at gender rights, but in the also in the late 60s, this is 1969, black uh, African American nurses going on strike in Charleston, South Carolina to demand equal pay to their white counterparts. Um, the last semester, we looked at immigrant rights um, through a film called The Hand That Feeds and Undocumented Workers in, in New York City. And this semester, I was mentioning before, we're looking actually at um, singing and the power of song as a vehicle for change um, and as a way to bring people together in their different struggles. And um, I hear some feedback, Didi, am I, is my time? Your, your time is basically up. Can you, if you could wrap it up, that'd be great. Great. So um, I'll just uh, stop share and, um, you know, the project is evolving and in collaboration and um, I welcome questions and comments and thoughts at the end. Thanks so much.
Thank you, Jacob. Really appreciate it. I, I think all of um, the presenters today could have used the full session. <laughs> so um, fascinating, and we'll get to questions. Um, I'm going to move right along to uh, Laurel Gray and turn it over to you. All right, you need to unmute. OK, unmute. There you go. I'm trying to share my screen here, right here. Uh, let's do that. And now, there we go. So way back in 2020 BC, actually before coronavirus, the 17th Central Asian Dance Camp had planned to bring a master instructor from Tashkent to the embassy in Washington, DC to train American dancers. Last year's camp was also held at the Uzbek embassy and hosted People's Artists of Uzbekistan, Kislohan Dusmohamedova. We had 20 participants from different states with a morning and afternoon classes, lectures on Uzbek dance and culture, delicious meals um, prepared by the embassy chef so people could get acquainted and, and enjoy the cuisine. Um, and it really had an opportunity to get to know each other, get to know real Uzbeks, and also featured performances for the participants and invited guests. But now with COVID-19, there's a new challenge. How do we take a total immersion camp and do it in a remote teaching environment? First of all, the camp, the term camp may seem odd because here we are in this elegant surroundings of the embassy of Uzbekistan, but Central Asian Dance Camp actually started at Synergy Ranch in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, where we had the settings of really a Western movie, right? With uh, pinion and Jupiter trees. And in this beautiful uh, venue, you could really escape from everyday life. It was total immersion, just Uzbek dance lessons, uh, like many, many hours a day. And then we would have costuming sessions. We would watch dance videos. And remember the early camp was before YouTube. So people could have an idea what it, it looked like. And they even had an opportunity to dress up in costume. Eventually we were able to get a visa for Kizil Hondas Mohamedova to come and be the guest teacher. This was pretty exciting for those days. And her personality, her warmth, her feminine style immediately made her the centerpiece of her future camps. So while Santa Fe was great for um, West Coast dancers, it was not so convenient for East Coast dancers. So in 2000, we relocated to the DC area and kindly the embassy of Uzbekistan allowed us to hold the dance camp there. So, um, and it was so it's stunning historic building, um, just a rare, rare opportunity. Over the years, we tried different dance studios in the DC area so that we would actually have mirrors and a dance floor. But uh, starting in about 2014, we ran into some problems getting studios and also visa difficulties. So there was a hiatus, but quite happily back in 2019, we got to start up again. And this time we had even some new participants, young women with Central Asian roots, but wanted to, who wanted to reconnect with their culture of origin. So could these personal connections successfully translate to a virtual format? And here's where we turned again to the embassy for help. So instead of canceling the planned in-person instruction, every aspect of Central Asian Dance Camp was reinvented with the assistance of the embassy. Ambassador Javlan Vokhava readily agreed to these adaptations and he opened the camp with an official greeting. So uh, noting that this enthusiasm was a clear sign of pure American interests. And, and he described Uzbek dance as a vivid personification of the beauty of Uzbek culture. Following this formal launch, um, cultural attache Akhbar Borkhanov led a virtual tour of the embassy building, which is a treasure trove of Uzbek paintings and folk art. So we, we got to be up close and personal. 
we engaged two master teachers from Uzbekistan, people's artist of Uzbekistan, Kadir Mumina, and the artistic director of the Lazgi Ensemble, Shanazar Batira. They had access in Tashkent to the very needed remote technology and a huge screen. So all the little tiles with the dancers could be seen. But even so, we, we limited the number of participants for this reason. The, also, this whole I, this nine hour time difference meant that we had, could only have morning classes. <clears throat> and people in the West Coast who zoomed in had to be ready to dance at six o'clock in the morning. That's dedication. <clears throat> but they felt that this added immediacy to be live from Uzbekistan. <clears throat> Teaching in a foreign, uh, a foreign movement vocabulary to people in confined spaces is a challenge. And you all are gonna find this out pretty soon. Um, so we know that the teachers had a big, uh, teaching space, but people were learning in their homes and they also had to deal with their families and pets and all that sort of thing. So we changed the format and we had short 90 minute sessions because that's about a, a good a good time for a dance class. Um, and we sprinkled the class instead of having a concentrated number of days, we sprinkled all the events over two weeks. Another Ad adaptation was the choice of dance styles. So we did, we went to Uzbek culture and history to figure this one out. Because those big dramatic stage co uh, choreographies that you might know from Soviet times, not possible. But there's an Uzbek folk saying, Yakshi rokasa bitta joyda oinasha mumkan. A good dancer needs only one space to dance properly. So you can dance well in one space. And traditionally, Uzbek female dances were uh, confined to the gendered space called Ichkari, the inner, the inner quarters of women. <clears throat> Uzbek dance only came to the Western stage like less than 100 years ago. So the traditional dances often were done in place. And because of this, we could just go to one of these dances like Lazgi, which is from the Khwarezm area. And it emphasized a lot of isolation and articulate gestures. So it was ideal for people who were stuck in a confined space, their own modern day Ishkari. Precise and patient, Shah Nazar, who you see here, he would work, he would repeat. And this is where Zoom is really good for going in on, on specific hand motions and things. Um, we also worked with Kadir Mumina, and this was a style that he taught, which is from Bukhara, which you might know from those fabulous carpets. Uh, and people were saying this is an opportunity of a lifetime and really express gratitude to both Kadir and Shah Nazar for sharing the legacy of Uzbek dance and enriching their lives um, with beauty and happiness. The goal of total immersion required innovation as well. And as we all know, learning about cuisine is a way, great way to understand a new culture. And right here, you can see um, Selma Jean Cohen, who was part of my uh, 1989 theatrical and dance delegation to Uzbekistan. And in an Uzbek home with uh, waiting for the national dish to be served, which is plof. So the Uzbek embassy chef, uh, Hamidullah Shamsudinov, gave a cooking demonstration of how to prepare plof. Okay, this is a problem because to do it right, it takes three hours and all the ingredients he had listed in kilos. But here again, um, the cultural attache, Ahor, helped and filmed portions of the process ahead of time. And then we were also to have live questions and after, answers afterwards. And uh, people felt that they, the cooking demonstration provided details up close that you wouldn't, if you'd just been standing there, you wouldn't have been able to get the same kind of view. So it actually improved it. Let's hope that the embassy starts an annual cooking show. Several inspired campers went home and they made plof and then, um, you know, tried their own take on it. So I'm hoping everyone's getting hungry. Um, another aspect of the in-person camp was the opportunity to shop for costuming items or beautiful, uh, folk art from Uzbekistan. So again, we innovated and we had a virtual Silk Road Bazaar inviting female entrepreneurs to come and show their um, items. Uh, we also had lectures on costuming. 
and lectures on Uzbek culture. So um, there we, um, we have to say that the most exciting part was a virtual museum tour to the home of Tamara Khanum. She was the very first woman to dance in public. This is less than a hundred years ago. And her life was threatened. One of the um, young women who studied dance with her and performed with her was actually murdered at the age of 16 because she appeared in public unveiled. So we, thanks to the embassy and the Ministry of Culture, we got to go to her home museum, which I know well, um, I actually worked there for a time. Uh, this is her beautiful home in Tashkent, now a museum, it has all these pictures um, of her life. It has her costumes, uh, some of the great, I mean, she had this you know, million dollar smile. She went all over the world learning dance and songs and really being a cultural ambassador. Uh, and I got to know her personally, uh, just one of those rare personalities. So that for many was the highlight to, to actually be able to go into her home and see all these things and understand her great love for Uzbek culture, even though she was an ethnic Armenian, but she grew up in the Uzbek community out in the Fergana Valley and really embraced these people, not only Uzbeks, but all cultures. She really felt <clears throat> that music and dance was a way that we could understand each other and build peace. So one of the most magical elements was the camaraderie that developed between dancers. We got to know each other. How could we recre recreate this on Zoom? Because we're in our little tiles in dance class. Once again, Uzbek culture came to the rescue and we created a virtual chaihwana. A chaihwana is a, is a tea house. So we, get to, we all decided to get together um, after the last day of dance class and people could ask questions and chat. Many were Russian speakers, so they could they could speak directly with our teacher, our original teacher, Kislohandis Mohamedova. She zoomed in from her home in Tashkent. And uh, this meeting also coincided with the celebration of Uzbekistan's 29th Independence Day. Now, Organizing the virtual camp was actually more difficult than an in-person camp because there were so many different sessions and different participants and different moving parts and pieces. But it also made the camp more accessible and more affordable. People didn't have to pay to travel to DC or get a hotel room. And we got a broader attendance. We had not only people from all over the US, but from Canada the UK and even New Zealand. So while the vo virus forced people into their personal 21st century Ichkari, um, it also took us all back to the roots of Uzbek dance, reminding that while COVID had separated us, it also had brought us closer together. After all, Yakshi Rokosa Bitsa Joida Oinasha Munkin. And I now am going to teach you in less than two minutes, an Uzbek dance. So please take a moment to move away from your desk. Look at this picture, you're gonna to need to remember this. I'm gonna have some music and we're gonna, I'll show you first the movements. Very easy, the first movement, your opening pose will also be our, our closing pose is like this. And we'll be flipping our head, we'll doing change, and we're gonna tell a story. So we're gonna do this movement, which is kind of tricky when you try it, but uh, it, you're crossing your central axis. We're going to hit our wrists together, inside, outside. We're gonna have prairie dogs because those are desert animals out in the Kiva area. We're gonna pick apples and share them because Uzbeks are very hospitable that way. And then you're going to get on your horse, ride to your friend's house and share apples. And then finally, the, the last pose is the same as the beginning pose. And we're gonna do this in just over one minute. So here we go. I hope the sound worked. And we're... All right.
Ah, <laughs> This dance, by the way, is reputedly a healing dance. So uh, maybe this is another method we could use to get rid of COVID. Anyway, um, thank you for your attention. And I hope that actually getting away from your desk and moving a little bit was invigorating. And thank you for attending this session. Laurel, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I decided not to participate because uh, I'd be the only one doing that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that was great. All right, we'll move to our last um, our last presenter now, um, Pamela Holland, and take it away, Pamela. Thank you so much. Thank you, Didi. I'm so happy to be here with you. Um, and you can see I'm at the piano. Um, I am a concert pianist, and I've spent my whole career trying to make classical music inclusive and accessible for all people, which isn't exactly what the classical music field is known for. So it isn't always easy, but that's been my mission. My presentation for you today um, is designed to empower you to stretch your ears so that when we connect our ears to our hearts, um, when we listen to music, especially music we wouldn't necessarily consider to be our music, um, that is when we can develop empathy for other people. Um, so I'm definitely a firm believer in the power of one, you know, right now, especially it's so easy for an individual to feel like we can't have any impact on large problems, but you can, and I hope that this is inspiring to you. I will perform for you three extremely different pieces from, uh, widely different genres. Two out of the three have lyrics, but because I'm playing them, uh, for piano arrangements, we're not using the lyrics, and I really feel by stripping those lyrics out, you'll be um, more readily able to hear the emotional intent of the music. Um, I want to share two very quick, profound experiences I've had in Poland. The first, of course, is my Fulbright Fair in um, three years ago, and this was a life-changing experience. Didi already mentioned that I combined teaching uh, American music and culture with um, research about the great pianist and Polish composer Frederick Chopin with a project called Chopin's Mazurkas as a form of Slavic blues. And then I performed all over uh, Poland, connecting with people through music, everything from US embassy events to going to Polish grade schools. And um, it was really terrific. Although I've been a musician my whole life and I'm a longtime former faculty member at Wake Forest University in the music department here in North Carolina, in Poznan at Adam Mickiewicz University, I was a member of the English faculty. So it was not a conservatory or music school and I was surrounded by non-musicians, which was fantastic for me because I learned to hear like a non-musician. The second life-changing event happened for me in Poland in 2013 when um, I was performing for World Music Day in Warsaw and I was literally out on the street with a grand piano, the main street, Nowy Świat. On my right side was the Church of the Holy Cross where Chopin's actual heart resides. And on the left side, a limousine pulled up, the window rolled down and out shone Paul McCartney's smiling face. He gave me a thumbs up and he drove away. And this shocking and amazing experience really somehow gave me the permission and the freedom as a classical musician to combine, go with my instincts and combine music from very, very different uh, cultures and regions. And it resulted in a program that I have called Chopin Meets the Beatles, Songs of Love, Loss and Longing. And I actually have the CD cover. That really is Paul McCartney and that's me. And it's not Photoshopped, I can't believe how many times people ask me, is that Photoshop? <laughs> no, it really amazingly happened. Um, but what I've discovered is that it's the music of loss, longing, and homesickness, if you will, that truly brings us together. Those feelings are woven into music of every culture, and they function every bit as much for the individual as for groups of displaced people all over the world. 
So one more quick thing before we get to the music. My favorite Polish word is żal. It's spelled Z-A-L with a dot over the Z. And in English, it simply means melancholy. But in Polish, it has a whole nuanced range of meanings. Melancholy, sadness, loss, nostalgia, regret, even despair. And it all turns on the idea that something has been lost that can never be regained. And this is an extremely powerful way that we connect and have empathy for other people. And you will hear this in the music. Something that has been lost, especially in COVID times, that can never be regained. So we're going to head over to the piano. And um, we don't have time today for a complete musical analysis. This is what I call drive-by teaching. So I will point out some of the important musical elements that connect and link these pieces. I will start with a spiritual, an African-American spiritual, um, very famous called Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. Now you will recall that the spirituals are the forerunner of the American blues. And um, they reflect the deep pain and suffering of the slave culture of the American South. And Frederick Douglass, former slave and abolitionist, said this about spirituals. Every tone was a testimony against slavery and a prayer to God for deliverance from chains. The hearing of those wild notes always depressed my spirit and filled me with ineffable sadness. I have frequently found myself in tears while hearing them. So we don't need the lyrics to understand the music. If we are listening with our hearts, the lyrics are simple. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child, repeated two times, a long way from home. Now we move on to a very different part of the 19th century, 19th century Poland. And Frederick Chopin, we all know him as a genius, but he was also a man. And he had all the same kind of problems that we all do, love problems, relationship problems, money problems, health problems. But he had powerful żal. And um, he poured his melancholy, his deep melancholy into his music, all of the different kinds of pieces. But it was not only personal, but he had he was in exile um, halfway through his life. He only lived 39 years, but the November 1830 revolution happened in, Paris, in Poland, Warsaw, and he had to flee. 
So his profound sense of displacement and homesickness especially spurred him on to composing mazurkas. And the mazurka is the typical Polish dance. So I'd like to play you one in E minor, and it begins like this. So we have the minor key, but here's the musical symbolism of that melodic line. Falling line, sadness, but there's a leap of the interval of a seventh um, an interval is just a distance between notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But no. And then it, the sequence. So the underlying melodic uh, structure is hope, but no. Hope, no. And um, this is Chopin's actual piece, not an arrangement. And the last piece that I will play you is the very famous tune by the Beatles called Yesterday. And again, this comes from this um, musical intuition of mine that these pieces all have this same powerful, um, powerful sense of jal, if you will, or melancholy if we're listening with our hearts. You know that yesterday is an exp expression of personal pain. It's the pain of a generation. These feelings are universal. And as I said before, we're not going to use lyrics, but in the melody, yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. So you will remember that seventh away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. I believe in yesterday. So again, the underlying melodic sort of harmonic structure is this sense of um, hope or longing, but that's dashed. Uh, hope, despair. Same melodic underpinning. So this is a piece, I won't play it in a pop style. I've arranged it in a Chopin style so that you can more readily hear the connections between all of these different, these are just three examples of various different musical genres all over the world, but we all have these same feelings and it connects us.
So thank you for listening. I hope you feel those connections and try listening to something, maybe country, maybe jazz, maybe hip hop, something that isn't your go-to music and see if you can develop that empathy for others. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela. I, I just don't know how you could put more energy and passion into an hour and 15 minutes than the four of you have done. It's, it's incredible. Um, and to know that you've had your relationships in, um, from France and Guatemala and Uzbekistan and Poland is just incredible. So thank you. We, we aren't going to have very many, uh, any time to ask some the very specific questions. A lot of you got questions. Um, I'm going to try to make sure that you can follow up with the panelists. Everyone wants your video. Everyone wants your presentations. Um, so, but to ask the questions that we're getting are so specific that each one of you would need 10, 15 minutes to answer it. So I just want to ask one general question for all of you. Um, what strikes me is the relationships that you've built um, in your Fulbright and after, how, how do you hope to maintain those relationships, um, especially in the immediate future um, for the next year or so? And, and how do you build on that? So um, Heather, why don't we start with you? Everyone can unmute. Um, yes, I'm, I'm frantically trying to answer everybody and give my email because I love all the questions and I feel like, <laughs> I'm like, I feel so bad because I didn't answer everything because there's so much that I want to say. Um, so yes, these relationships are still building. Like I have not uh, abandoned any, I feel like we really developed um, a camaraderie and, and group trust and, <clears throat> you know, similar to what Laurel is doing like we still we have amazing technology to connect us now and um, I check in with them um, frequently um, uh, one of the volunteers and I are, are um, we actually communicate um, with our phone using a, an app where it's free like all of this is free so it's amazing that we can still stay connected and um, I get notices of, you know, somebody just completed their, their interview. Um, uh, somebody got a job recently doing um, cooking and was in a participant in the Marseille um, migrant food cooking tour. And so like, th they're doing really well. M many of them are doing really well. So th we are um, still connected. I truly believe that we live in a time in which the, the that this technology is here to help us strive even more for peaceful connections and intercultural understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Jacob, what about you? Um, well, let me just say it's such an honor to present with all of you. And I just love the other presentations um, with the dance and the music and theater. Um, I also quickly want to just give gratitude to my wife, Teresa, who's um, taking care of our three boys right now so I can be on the presentation. <laughs> and there are many things going on behind the scenes, I know, for a lot of people. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, just a, a thought about relationships is that I have found that, you know, having done this work prior to COVID-19 and so many places of gathering being shut down, it's really cultivated a kind of a resilience among our participants because we kept meeting. Um, we, you know, said, okay, well, let's just try Zoom, and we tried it, or you know, Google Meet, or whatever it is, um, early on. And so we've been able to continue those relationships. Um, and it certainly is exhausting, you know, at times to be so much in front of the screen and to have that relationship be so focused um, on, you know, a, a virtual uh, uh, kind of a, you know, digital screen, but. It's just, it's so important. And um, I have, you know, just phone calls each day with different people to check in. Um, a lot of members of our community have been put on an extended furlough. Uh, so that's more than a thousand workers, many, many of our participants. Um, so, you know, now it's, it's about calling and just checking in on people too, and just seeing how folks are and being present in the reality of the situation and how devastating it is for so many people. Um, but the maintenance of those relationships is, is just so important. And I, I imagine in, in all of these um, projects too, you know, maintaining 
uh, and really growing the relationships whenever possible. You know, just, you know, particularly seeing Heather and Laurel move uh, programming to the virtual format and having done that myself, it really is um, kind of the only safe way to do it now and, and just critical to all of us, for all of us to, to maintain those. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Laurel. We're very lucky because the uh, Uzbek Embassy is right here in the DC area where I live. And we have been in contact with them for many years. I'm teaching classes in from Zooming from my home for people uh, continuing with Uzbek dance, but also planning uh, future events with the embassy, some virtual, um, hope we can get passes. And also Uzbekistan has co totally embraced this technology and they have been doing um, virtual conferences, scientific conferences in dance and uh, traditional arts. So they're, they're ready to go. Um, and they were all set to have a fabulous tour se season this year, um, but inshallah next year. So we, we continue teaching, communicating, and uh, with my dance company, we're going to have a virtual dance concert uh, in November. So if you go to Silk Road Dance, you can find out about it and watch online. Fantastic. That sounds wonderful. Pamela, give us a last word. Yes, you know, like all other performing musicians I know, having lost all of our concerts, um, I've been I've learned how to do a lot of um, you know Facebook live streaming, and I found some sponsorship USMC <laughs> Poland, some radio stations, etc. But I think that what I've heard all of my colleagues say, and it's true, it's on you to reach out. And this is like old fashioned times almost of writing letters. This is the writing letters um, in let's have a call, let's have a FaceTime, let's have a Skype or a chat, whatever. And um, you, certainly you can go to my website, PamelaHowland.com or my YouTube channel and there's lots of videos on there, but it's given all of us performers, I think, especially um, a, a sense of gratitude about what we had. And I think this is the thing, this is the idea about this melancholy and this jal. We need to be grateful because what we had is never coming back in the same way. But that doesn't mean we can't innovate. And um, the, the main thing is connecting with people, connecting with our hearts and um, the arts is the best place to do it. So I thank you all. And please, um, you know, I'm, on, I'm online, so contact me. Thank you. Wow. Well, I can't thank all of you enough um, for really inspiring um, us this morning. So whoever didn't get up early really missed it. That's all I can say. <laughs> Anyway, thank you um, very much. And for those who I hope will continue on through the day with the sessions, um, the next session will begin at 11 o'clock. It will be peace, education, and social justice. So you have just enough time to pour a cup of coffee and pet your dog and come back to see us. Thank you all.